Good evening aspirants. Welcome to Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 20th February 2024. Displayed here are the list of topics we are going to see today. Now without wasting any time, let us get into the discussion. Look at this news article. Paytm is in the process of applying for third party application provider license. So this license will be provided by National Payments Corporation of India. Once Paytm obtains this license from NPCI, it will join other entities like Amazon Pay, Google Pay, Phone Pay, etc and operate on UPI platform. In order to operate on UPI platform, Paytm is applying for third party application provider from NPCI. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through NPCI for our prelims exam. See, National Payments Corporation of India, that is NPCI, is an umbrella organization for providing retail payments and settlement systems in India. It was established in 2008 under the provisions of Payment and Settlement System Act 2007. It is a joint initiative of Reserve Bank of India and Indian Banks Association. Remember, the main intention behind establishing NPCI is to provide in. infrastructure to entire banking system in india that is the infrastructure regarding electronic payment and settlement systems so npca is basically a not for profit company which is established under section 8 of company act 2013 now let us see the important payment systems created by npca first is upi the next one is bim app thirdly rupay this rupay credit card scheme is the first debit and credit card payment network of india and it is launched by npca the objective of rupay credit card scheme is to fulfill rbi's vision to offer a domestic multilateral system which will allow all the indian banks and financial institutions to participate in electronic payments also note that the rupay cards can be used not only in india but also in singapore bhutan uae bahrain and saudi arabia fourth three npca has also established aadhar enabled payment system so this payment system leverages aadhar for biometric verification it helps individuals to make financial transaction securely without needing for physical card or pin next is nach that is national automated clearing house it is an electronic clearing service that automates repetitive financial transactions like salary loan emi collections and more so this is also established by npca so these are some of the important basic information about npca with this let us conclude the discussion and move to the next news article now look at this news article the supreme court on monday stayed further proceedings before a lok sabha privilege committee the committee has earlier summoned the west bengal chief secretary and other officers regarding a complaint filed by bjp mp the bjp mp has alleged that there was misconduct brutality and life threatening injuries to him so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us understand about parliamentary privileges and also about lok sabha privilege committee for our prelims exam Firstly what are parliamentary privileges see parliamentary privileges are certain rights and immunities enjoyed by members of parliament both individually and collectively this is to ensure that they can function effectively without any interruption see the parliamentary privileges also extend to certain non members of the parliament for example attorney general of india or any minister who may not be a member but speaks in the house also enjoy parliamentary privileges The privileges are mentioned in constitution under article 105 for parliament and article 194 for state assemblies. The privileges are also mentioned in the rule book of Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. But note that there has been no law so far been enacted in this respect. So the parliamentary privileges are mainly guided by conventions. Now what is a breach of privilege? See a breach of privilege is a violation of any privilege of MPs or parliament. This may include publishing of news items, editorials or statements made in newspaper or even in TV interviews. Now there are two categories of privileges. One is collective privilege and individual privilege. See the collective privileges are those enjoyed by each house of the parliament collectively and individual privileges are those enjoyed by individual members of parliament. Note that each house of the parliament is the guardian of its privileges. Now let us look at the Privileges Committee of Parliament. See, each House of the Parliament has its own Privilege Committee. In Lok Sabha, it consists of 15 members, and in Raj Sabha, it consists of 10 members. In Lok Sabha, the members of Privilege Committee are nominated by Speaker, and in case of Raj Sabha, they are nominated by Chairman. But note that the Deputy Chairman is the head of Privilege Committee in Raj Sabha. So, the function of Privilege Committee is to examine every question involving breach of privilege of the House. 
so this is about the parliamentary privileges and the basics of privilege committee of parliament with this let us conclude the discussion and move to the next news article discussion look at this editorial article it is written in the backdrop of upcoming state visit of greece prime minister to india as per the sources he will be visiting india for next two days so the article highlights several opportunities for india within the context of strategic partnership with greece so let us understand the important points in the article using our main sensor writing practice so this topic comes under gs paper 2 under bilateral regional and global groupings and agreements involving india are affecting india's interest now let me read the question for you discuss the significance of strategic partnership between india and greece in the context of evolving geopolitical dynamics in eastern mediterranean and indo pacific regions so the only keyword in the question is discuss so you are expected to cover different viewpoints or perspectives related to the given subject so in this answer first we are going to write about the diplomatic ties between india and greece and in the second part of the answer we can write about the future prospects in the ties finally we are going to give a balanced judgment in the conclusion part so this is how we are going to address this question now moving on to the introduction part here you can write that the greek port of preas is one of the major ports in india middle east economic corridor this demonstrates the notable developments in bilateral relationship between greece and india Greece has consistently been supportive of India's foreign policy objectives while India agrees with Greece's emphasis on advancing international law and regional security. So along with having similar concerns about international terrorism, the two countries have strengthened their relationship through many bilateral initiatives. In this way you can give your own introduction. Now let us move into the body part of the answer. In the first part of the body of the answer, we can write about diplomatic ties between India and Greece. Let us start with the historical ties. See, India's engagement with Greece spans over 2500 years. It is marked by trade, literature and art interactions. As we find evidence in coins and writings, trade links and cultural exchanges existed between Mauryan kings and Greece. Following the ancient ties, the modern diplomatic ties was established in 1950 and it has progressed smoothly for over next 70 years. Greece supported India on issues like nuclear supplier group, missile technology control regime and it also supported India's attempt for permanent seat in UN Security Council. Apart from this, the state visit of respective heads of states have enhanced cooperation for past few years. Now coming to the commercial relations. See, the bilateral trade between India and Greece stood at 2 billion US dollars in 2022 to 2023. India exports aluminium, organic chemicals, fish, iron and steel to Greece, while Greece exports mineral oils, fuels, sulfur and aluminium foil, etc. Both the countries share institutional linkages, joint economic committee and foreign office consultations. Fourthly, regarding bilateral defense cooperation, both the countries have committed to cooperate in areas like military training, joint exercises, defense industry collaboration, etc. The defense cooperation became important between the two countries only after 1998. Fifthly, with the aim of encouraging and supporting cooperation in the field of science and technology, on the basis of equality and mutual benefit, the agreement on science and technology was signed in 2007. So these are the important points regarding the ties between India and Greece. Now in the second part of the body of the answer, we are going to write about the future outlook between the two countries. See firstly, India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. It presents an opportunity for India to strengthen its economic ties with the entire Europe including Greece. So in this way, Greece will be important gateway for Indian trade to Europe. Secondly, India and European Union are currently negotiating for wide range free trade agreement. So it is officially known as broad based bilateral trade and investment agreement. With the support of Greece, India can conclude this agreement effectively. Finally, with respect to maritime security, India's Sagar initiative, that is security and growth for all in the region. This initiative aligns with Greece strategic location in Eastern Mediterranean. So these are the important points regarding future prospects between the two nations. 
Now we have completed the body part of the answer. Now moving on to the conclusion part. Even though the strategic partnership between India and Greece opens up various opportunities for economic, cultural and diplomatic cooperation, there is a need to strengthen people to people ties between India and Greece. So initiatives like student exchanges, cultural programs and media cooperation should be enhanced to foster greater understanding and collaboration between the two countries. So in this way you can end the answer positively with a balanced judgment. So this is all regarding this discussion. Now let us move to the next news article. Look at this article. It talks about the fluctuation in prices of Jira, that is cumin. The article highlights the volatility in agricultural markets and the volatility shows that there is necessity of providing price assurance to farmers. So in this article, we are going to discuss about what can be the alternatives for MSP. See, there are two main propositions to consider for the alternatives of MSP. One is deficiency price payment system and another one is direct income support schemes. Let us see them one by one. First, let us understand about deficiency price payment system, DPP system. See, when the market price falls below the MSP, the farmers will be compensated the amount that is difference between market price and MSP. So, in this system, there is no requirement for physical procurement of crops. Thereby, it is less costlier compared to MSP system because in MSP system, the government spend significant amount of money for procurement and storage. But in this system, there is no need to procure and store the food grains. See, the DPP system aims to protect farmers against market price volatility. So, it encourages them to diversify crops beyond traditional water incentive ones. However, the feasibility of implementing DPP system on national level requires careful examination because there were challenges observed in state level implementation such as traders gaming the system and complexities in compensation calculation. Now let us see about direct income support scheme which is also considered to be an alternative for MSP. See under this direct income support schemes, a fixed amount of money is directly transferred to bank account of farmers. This is irrespective of their crop prices or production volumes. The direct income support will not interfere with the market prices or crop choice. So it promotes the agricultural diversification and sustainability. The example for direct income support schemes include PM Kisan Samman Nidhi, this PM Kisan Samman Nidhi provides 6,000 annually to the farmer families. There is Telangana's Raitu Bandhu scheme and Odisha's Krushak assistance for livelihood and income augmentation scheme. So these are the examples for direct income support schemes. So this direct income support scheme and DPP system can be considered as alternatives to MSP. So with this let us conclude the discussion and move to the next news article. Look at this article. Recently, the Supreme Court has ordered that the definition of forest should remain broad. This decision came while hearing petitions against recent amendments to Forest Conservation Act. So the recent amendments to the act limited the definition of forest. But the Supreme Court has asked the government to keep the definition of forest very elaborate and broad. So this is the news given here in this context. Let us understand about Forest Conservation Act and its background. The Forest Conservation Act of 1980 is an important piece of legislation and the primary goal was to conserve forest and their resources. Now what is the need for this act? See the previous laws like Indian Forest Act of 1865 and 1927 version primarily protected the commercial interest of British Empire. So after independence, India recognized the need for a new law that specifically focused on preserving the forest ecosystem rather than exploiting them for raw materials. So this is why Forest Conservation Act of 1980 was introduced. Now let us understand the futures of this act. See the act centralizes the authority requiring state governments and other bodies to obtain permission from central government for any forest related decisions. An advisory committee assists the central government in the matters of forest conservation and the act also imposes penalties for non-compliance. See there are three important sections of this act. The section 1 talks about definition of the act. Section 2 talks about restrictions on converting forest land for non-forest purposes including cultivation of various crops and plants. And then section 3 talks about the details of formation of advisory committee to guide the central government on forest preservation. In 1996, 
the supreme court ordered a nation wide suspension of tree felling so this decision emphasized the application of forest conservation act to broader range of land specifically the act would now apply not only to the land which are officially recorded as forest but also to the land that fit the dictionary meaning of the forest so this expansive interpretation mean that a wider area of land will be brought into the category of forest so in june 2022 the indian government took a step further by amending the forest law the amendments proposed a new mechanism to facilitate development projects in forest developers were allowed to establish plantations on land where forest conservation act did not apply so these plantation could then be credited against their obligations for compensatory afforestation now let us understand about the amendment made in 2023 see last year the central government made serious amendments to this forest conservation act the first one is declared or notified forest land so this includes areas officially designated as forest by indian forest act of 1927 the second one is the land notified as forest after october 25 1980 so this covers areas which are not previously recognized as forest land but officially identified as in government records However the forest lands recorded before 1980 are not officially designated as reserved areas or excluded from the protection of this act so this is an important amendment made to forest conservation act last year so this represents a shift from supreme court's 1996 verdict so this is why recently supreme court ruled that the definition of forest should be kept very broad rather than limited definition which is kept by central government last year so this is all about the news now let us move to the next part of our discussion now we have come to the prelims practice question discussion look at the first question consider the following statements regarding forest conservation act 1980 look at the first statement This act centralizes the authority for forest conservation requiring state governments to obtain permission from central government for any non forest use of forest land yes this statement is correct the supreme court's decision in 2023 upheld the broad definition of forest as per its verdict in tn godavarman tirumulpad case of 1996 so this statement is also correct the question is asking about the incorrect statement so the answer is option d none now moving on to the second question it is about msp system in india deficiency price payment system compensates farmers for difference between market price and msp when the market price is lower yes this statement is correct direct income support schemes transfer a fixed amount of money directly into bank account of farmers this statement is also correct the dpp system involves physical procurement of crops by government to stabilize market prices this statement is incorrect because dpp system does not involve physical procurement of crops so the correct answer is option c 1 and 2 only and this is the main question for you today interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section with this we have come to the end of the discussion if you like the video please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel thank you